Thanks for something I considered optional. And I, I think it's important um, when we look at these papers, you know, arguably the, um, the data, the, 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 the observations of, of the consequences are, are I would argue, uh, intuitive. Uh, but it reminds me of, of the famous uh, Mark Twain quote, uh, it ain't what you uh, don't know that gets you in trouble, it's what you know for sure that isn't that ain't so, uh, that does. So it's nice that we can actually identify some facts because they can be described for the future. Uh, the ground rules are as before. Um, each presentation, 15 minutes, I'll give a five minute sit uh, warning. And then the discussant will speak for 15 minutes of the number of questions. Thank you very much. I'm going to talk about the effects of liquidity regulation on bank demand in monetary policy operations. So uh, academics and policymakers have argued that liquidity regulation may affect bank behavior in monetary policy operations. The argument is very simple. Liquidity regulation requires that banks hold liquid assets. But monetary policy may uh, remove liquidity from the system to raise interest rates. So there you see that there's a conflict. And as far as, as we know, there's no empirical evidence that this effect is actually happening. And this is what we're going to do here. We're going to examine the effects of liquidity requirement and bank behavior in, in one monetary policy too. This monetary policy too is called the term deposit facility. Uh, and the liquidity regulation that we are studying is the liquidity coverage ratio. So uh, the liquidity coverage ratio is the ratio between high quality liquid assets that are a bank holds and the projected net cash outflow over 30 days for that bank. So it's, it's, the, it's a proxy for the ability of banks to uh, uh, satisfy the, its commitments in a period of, of stress with, with, uh, with uh, over 30 days. And uh, what, what happens is that a bank, a bank, bank may use its excess reserves to, uh, to satisfy the LCR because excess reserves uh, are considered high quality liquid assets. But these term deposits that are offered by the Fed, they are deducted from excess reserves. And initially they were not considered uh, high quality liquid assets because uh, they, were, they had a maturity of seven days and could not uh, be withdrawn prior to maturity. So the LCR may lower participation in these term deposit facility operations because uh, the bank has to uh, take part of its excess reserves and, and put it in, this, in, this deposits, in these deposits that are not uh, helping the bank to satisfy the LCR. Now, ideally, we would just uh, estimate how the, the LCR affects uh, demand for these deposits by examining the behavior of banks subject to the LCR compared to banks that are not subject to the LCR. The problem is that uh, there's endogeneity there. The, the banks that regulators selected as uh, covered by the LCR may have some characteristics that we cannot observe that affect uh, their behavior in these uh, in operations for the term deposit facility. So what we're going to do to estimate the effects of the LCR on demand for these term deposits is we're going to use variation in LCR coverage. We're going to compare the behavior of banks subject to the LCR with the behavior of banks not subject to the LCR. And we're also going to use variation, a key characteristic of the term deposit facility. Uh, this characteristic is called the early withdrawal feature. I'm sorry about the excess of acronyms here. Uh, there are four acronyms uh, that you have to memorize somehow, but uh, whenever you see the EWF, it's, it's something very simple. It's just the ability of the bank to withdraw its deposits prior to maturity. Typically, these deposits have a maturity of seven days, and uh, initially, uh, the banks who uh, uh, use these deposits could not withdraw their, their money from uh, the deposits, but then uh, there was a change and, and banks now can withdraw their money subject to a penalty of 75 basis points. And uh, the idea is that 
banks covered by the LCR may be more interested in participating in TDF operations when this early withdrawal feature is introduced. So I'm going to spend some time with this chart. This chart is uh, the paper in a nutshell. So if you understand the chart, you, you, you will get everything that we have to offer in our paper. Uh, so here in the horizontal axis, we have time. The sample starts in May of 2014 and is in December of 2014. And uh, each observation here is, a, is an operation of the term deposit facility. We have eight operations before the introduction of this early withdrawal feature and eight operations after. And here in the vertical axis, we have the uh, participation rate of banks. This is simply the fraction of banks that uh, offered, submitted a tender for these deposits in each operation. And we divided banks in two groups. The banks subject to the LCR, which are the uh, blue triangles, and the banks not subject to the LCR, which are the red triangles. And in the meantime, you can think about banks subject to the LCR as banks with assets of uh, $50 billion or more, and banks not subject to the LCR as uh, banks below $50 billion uh, in, in assets. Uh, I'm going to talk about exactly what's the, the definition, but keep this, this threshold in mind, and this will be all you need. So what we see here is that the participation rate of banks not subject to the LCR is flat and very close to zero. And the participation rate of banks subject to the LCR uh, trends positively over time with no clear change around the, the introduction of this early withdrawal feature. Now, I'm going to narrow the sample a bit. Here we have all banks. Now I'm going to narrow the sample around this threshold of 50 billion to banks between 5 and 500 billion. And you, you can see that the, the red diamonds start to uh, raise a bit. And you also see apparently an, an acceleration, the trend here. And, and when we narrow it furthermore between uh, 25 and 100 billion, you see a, a clearer pattern here. And this is the, the story of the paper. Uh, you see that the, the banks not subject to the LCR still keep their participation rate low and apparently do not change the slope of uh, participation when the early withdrawal feature is introduced. But the banks subject to the LCR apparently uh, participate uh, more and more after the introduction of this feature. So the idea of the paper, what we're going to do is to estimate this change in the trend. And we attribute this change in the trend to the uh, advantage of the, of, of the term deposits relative to uh, sorry, between banks not subject to the LCR, banks subject to the LCR, uh, and, and this, uh, the effect of this advantage on the, the participation of banks. Is that clear to everyone? Okay. So let me go into the details of the LCR a bit. There are two versions in the, in the version that was in, in the application of the US. Uh, the standard LCR is applied to banks with 20 with $250 billion or more in total assets, or if they are uh, satisfy some characteristics that define them as complex, and to the depository institutions that are under uh, the umbrellas of these banks. And these banks, they started being required to satisfy the LCR in uh, 2015. Now, there's the modified version, which is uh, a lighter version. And the modified version is for banks uh, both 50 billion in assets. So that's why I told you that you can use this 50 billion threshold uh, as a rule of thumb. And, and the results are very similar if we just use this rule of thumb or if we, if we identify exactly the banks that are subject to the LCR. And these banks, uh, they had to start satisfying the LCR only in 2016. However, uh, we will assume that standard and modified LCR banks behave similarly. And actually, this chart here supports our assumption. So here you, we have time. And the gray area here is the, the period of our sample. It's uh, the last three quarters of 2014. 
And uh, the red line is, is showing the participation rate of, no, sorry, it's showing the ratio of HKLA holdings to total assets of banks, which, and HKLA holdings is the numerator of the LCR. And uh, you see that the, the banks not subject to the LCR, they behave in a different way compared to the banks subject to the standard, the black line, and to the modified LCR, the blue line. Now, the reason why I'm showing you the ratio of HKLA to total assets and not the LCR is because uh, we don't have data to measure exactly the denominator of the, the LCR. The, the numerator is HKLA, the denominator is that net cash outflow. And uh, the Fed now has a, a form that uh, some banks have to submit, but only the banks subject to the LCR have to submit that, and, and the data uh, started only recently, so we could not comp uh, build this chart um, with those data alone. So this is a proxy for the LCR. But the idea here is that banks uh, subject to the standard and modified LCR, they behave similarly, and that they started accumulating high quality liqu liquid assets uh, before they were subject to the LCR. So you see that Already in 2013, these banks were already accumulating uh, high quality liquid assets. The term deposit facility, again, is a tool used to control market interest rates. And uh, part as the data that we have here is, about operation, is from operational tests of this facility. In these tests, we were actually investigating whether uh, we had the logistical operational things in, in place. And we also changed a bit the characteristics of this facility to learn about demand. Um, unfortunately, we, we could not do a full-blown investigation by randomizing rates and, and things like this, but uh, we, we could uh, change a bit the characteristics uh, to better understand bank demand for this. Now, the key characteristic that changed is, as I mentioned, the early withdrawal feature. So before, we didn't have this early withdrawal feature, and in October, this feature was introduced. But at the same time, there was also uh, other changes in relevant characteristics. The rates offered, uh, you can see that the rates uh, range from 26 to 30, and you, you think about the opportunity cost as the interest on excess reserves of 25 basis points. So it's just a, a very, very uh, small spread above this uh, interest on excess reserves. And the tender size also changed a bit. So the data we have is a panel of almost 4,000 banks. The dependent variables are uh, dummy for submitting a tender and the dollar amount of the tender. We are using mainly the dummy for submitting a tender as opposed to the dollar amount because the dollar amount is censored from the left and from the right. We have um, a, a minimum uh, tender and we have a cap too. So it's uh, easier to interpret the results uh, when we use the, the dummy for tender offered. We have uh, lots of bank characteristics and we have the data from TDF Operations, the main verb again is, is whether we have a early withdrawal feature in, in the operation. So this is the equation that we're going to estimate. This is something very simple and very similar to, uh, to the, the figures that I showed you. So we have one term here that measures the, the, uh, the level of LCR banks compared with non-LCR banks the trend of the LCR banks compared with uh, non-LCR banks. And we have this term here, which is what we're interested in, the change in the trend once the early withdrawal feature is introduced. And so what we, the parameter that we are interested in is this gamma here. So let me show you the results. Uh, this is the sample with all banks. This is the, sam the narrower sample that I showed you uh, last in, in the charts. And what you see here is this, that this coefficient here increases as we narrow the sample, and we, which is uh, something that uh, supports our story. And the numbers, they have a very uh, clear interpretation. 
this point zero two three here means that for each operation after the early withdraw feature is introduced, uh, two point three uh, percent of the banks uh, are added to the the group of banks that participate in the early withdraw feature. So and uh, sorry that participate in the term deposit facility and this. 0.071 is a large number, means that for every operation after the early withdrawal feature is introduced, we have 7% uh, of the total group of banks that participates uh, in, in the third term deposit facility added to this group. Um, so let me skip the other results. There We have many robustness tests here, but uh, the, you already got the main idea. The, the idea is that the early withdrawal feature uh, increases the demand for these deposits for banks subject to the LCR relative to banks not subject to it. Now, there are open questions about effects of liquidity regulation. Uh, there's a lot of research from people uh, here and, and, in, and in other uh, departments uh, about the, for the effects of monetary policy through banks, and in particular what this literature has shown is that uh, bank characteristics affect the way that monetary policy is transmitted to the economy. So uh, this is the literature that we're trying to relate and we think that our result is, contributes to that. Thank you very much. Thank you. So uh, this paper is about the cost of immediacy for corporate bonds, which is a joint work with Marco Rossi from Texas a &M. And this up here is a very important question uh, for me, and if you're a corporate bond investor as well, let me try to uh, tell you why you should also think this is a very important question. So what you need to know about the corporate bond market is that it's an OTC market. So if you want to sell a corporate bond, you have to call up your dealer and say to him, I would like to sell this bond. And he can then do one of two things. He can say, Sure, I'm going to execute your order immediately, and he's going to do that by buying your bond and putting it on his inventory, keeping it on balance sheet. Or you can say, you want to sell your bond? Okay, uh, wait around. I'm going to try to locate a counterparty and uh, try to find someone willing to take the opposite position. So in the end, you will get your order executed, but it can take a second or a week or a month or whatever. So if you are in need of immediacy, you're really dependent upon the dealer's willingness to take on inventory and use his balance sheet. And uh, after the crisis, it's somewhat of an um, empirical fact that dealer inventories in these securities has gone down. So this up here is the primary dealer inventory of corporate securities in the US up here. So prior to the crisis, they increased a lot, then they dropped down, and then they came even further down after the crisis. This is for corporate securities, specifically for corporate bonds. It looked like this, so different scale, but the same behavior. So inventories are very low today. So if you ask the, uh, the industry, why do you keep these low inventories? Well, they will say something like this up here. It's because of the impact of regulation that uh, we have to run with lower inventory because the cost of having an inventory has increased a lot because of uh, capital requirements, because of the Volcker rule in the US, and uh, the same thing in Europe, not the Volcker rule, but the Lincoln. And this has then decreased liquidity. That's the argument from the industry up here. So the idea with all this regulation is that, well, these market makers should be more safe. So if they're more safe, they should be better able to withstand future financial turmoil and also be able to do market making at low costs during a future crisis. So it's a good thing to have safe market makers. But of course, we're not, uh, it's not a good idea to have uh, low liquidity in these markets. So the regulatory response to this up here, that they say this has hurt liquidity from the industry side, is to say, well, let's try to look at the data and see if it's really true. Can we see that liquidity is lower today than it used to be? And this up here is then a quote from a recent uh, EOSCO report, August 2016, so last month. And they concluded, we looked at the data and we cannot see anything. Liquidity is exactly the same as these markets as it used to be. So there's this great divide between industry and regulators, which is not something new. But in this case, it's very extreme at least. So let's try to look at the uh, argument of these uh, regulators up here. So what they do is that they do like something like this. So this up here is an illiquidity measure for the corporate bond market. Think about this as 
an index of transaction costs. Just during the crisis, transaction costs in these markets were very high. So this is kind of the situation you would like to avoid with the new regulation. You want to have safe market makers so that in a crisis, they can still facilitate trading and keep transaction costs low. And you can see outside the crisis, transaction costs are very low. And today, well, actually, they're even lower today than before the crisis. So what is exactly the industry is complaining about? They're saying liquidity is worse today, but realized transaction costs are actually lower than before the crisis. So this is kind of like the problem for the regulators. We look at the data and we cannot see it. If we take a one step back and look at the literature, well, specifically for the Volga rule up here, there are some papers saying that it should reduce systemic risk. There are a lot of good ideas about this. There's also a paper by Dale Duffy saying that, well, there's also some side effects that's going to uh, discourage this genuine market making. I'm going to return to this because we will confirm these uh, side effects from Dale Duffy. Empirically, there are only these uh, papers down here from regulators and uh, Trevi and Chiao saying that essentially the argument I made before, if we look at realized transaction costs, they're actually lower today than they used to be. But in some sense, looking at realized transaction costs is the wrong question to ask. What you should be asking is something like this up here. What do you prefer? If you're going from LA to New York, would you like to get immediacy or are you okay with taking the bus? <laughs> So it used to be the case in these markets that people got immediacy, but now they're all taking the bus because dealers are not willing to provide immediacy, or they are willing to do it, but at very high costs. So you have scared all the people over here, and now market makers are only matching people doing agency transactions. This over here would take something like five hours. This over here would take three days. But actually, if you look at realized transaction costs, if people switch from taking the plane to taking the bus, well, transaction costs, realized transaction costs, will be lower today. And that's what we see in these graphs from before. And that's uh, what our paper look at. We're going to try to estimate the cost of immediacy over here and see that this has actually gone through the roof. So uh, the problem up here is some kind of a Lucas critique, saying that you change the policy. And when you change the policy, you also impact the optimal behavior of the agents. They used to take the plane, now they take the bus. Uh, so our contribution here is to circumvent this Lucas critique by looking at a natural experiment down here where we know that people demand immediacy, and we also know that dealers provide this immediacy. So we're able to pin down the cost of immediacy. And that is by looking at index exclusions in corporate bonds. And these are purely mechanical, so there's no information up here. And we have these uh, index trackers seeking to minimize their tracking error. So they are extremely inelastic to, uh, to prices up here. And what we show is that this cost of immediacy has uh, more than double for investment grade bonds and triple for spec grade bonds. More generally, this is a, a comment on essentially all OTC markets where you are dependent upon the dealer's inventory. So this uh, tracking error stuff up here, we have these tracking errors. They seek to minimize, uh, we have these uh, index trackers, and they seek to minimize that tracking error. And they do that by transacting as close to the index rebalancing date as possible. And the index we look up here is uh, the Barclays Capital uh, Corporate Bond Index. It used to be the Lehman Index, but then something happened to Lehman. And it consists of all uh, investment grade bonds above a certain size. It's rebalanced at the last day of each month. And these rules for uh, inclusion and exclusions are purely mechanical. So no information when this index switches around. So the main reason for being excluded from the index is if your maturity falls below one year. So during the month, your maturity falls below one year. And then at the end of the month, you're going to get excluded from this uh, index up here. The same thing about downgrades from investment grade to spec grade. During the month, you're going to get downgraded at some point, and then at the end of the month, so later on, you're going to get excluded from the index. So again, no information in the actual exclusions. Information should be at the downgrade day itself. So these are the two events we're going to look at. So we can try to see, so is there really a demand for immediacy at these events? And there is. So this up here is the uh, trading volume around this index rebalancing date. You can see how trading volume spikes up, and this is for the downgrade exclusions. So a lot of people want to transact on this date in order to minimize their tracking error. The same thing for the maturity exclusions. A lot of transaction on this date. So clearly there is a demand for immediacy. We would like to trade on this specific date up here. And uh, then they do it. On the other hand, we also have the, uh, the other side of the market. Those who supply immediacy. So if you look at the dealer side, we can tease out the uh, dealer inventories around this event by taking all dealer sales taking all dealer buys, subtracting them, and cumulating them over time. 
And this is then dealer inventories around these events up here for the downgraded bonds. So uh, not much action, and then you have the index exclusion, and then they supply this immediacy by taking these bonds onto an inventory, then they start to sell out again afterwards and decrease this. So we have a demand for immediacy, we have a supply of immediacy up here. If we look at the uh, behavior of these dealers from before to after the crisis, we can split up this graph uh, in a pre-crisis and a post-crisis graph. So the red line and the green line here is before the crisis and also during the crisis. And what we see is that they supply the immediacy, but then they keep these bonds on inventory. So these bonds seem like a very good buy. So let's keep them in inventory, we do proprietary trading, essentially speculation. And this is what you want to avoid with the new regulation. You don't want market makers to be risky, so they shouldn't do this kind of speculation. You can also see after the crisis, they no longer do this regulation. So in some sense, the regulation was a success. People are no longer taking us this, uh, this uh, risk, and uh, market makers are more safe than they used to be. But it comes at the cost of a of higher cost of immediacy. Let's try to look at the cost of immediacy. <coughs> you can do the same thing for the uh, maturity exclusions. But let's try to look at the cost of immediacy and how we estimate it. So we're going to use this trace data, which is uh, transaction data. We got it from FINRA, sample period 2002 to 13. And we have dealer identifiers, so we can look at uh, the specific dealer's inventory and see how much immediacy did that dealer provide. I'm going to mimic dealer returns, so we're going to try to look at dealers they buy at the index exclusion date and later on they sell out. So we're going to do a dealer buy and a dealer sell so that the price change we see is some kind of a selling pressure plus whatever the bid ask spread is. So this is the, uh, the dealer returns essentially. You have to be a dealer in order to realize these returns. And these are then the returns. Uh, there's some raw returns, and then you also do abnormal returns. So we're going to subtract a uh, benchmark uh, matched on rating and maturity. And this is what we see up here. And this is the return in basis points. So there are some equally rated returns. But over here, we have the uh, weighted returns. We're going to weigh with how much immediacy did the, uh, did the dealer provide. And if you look at these, then this over here is something like from day zero, the index exclusion, to one day after, two days after, five days after, and so on. So one you can look at is this, 7.5 basis points. These are not annualized returns. These are just the return you get over these uh, five business days. Uh, before the crisis, seven. During the crisis, 57. Dealers are more constrained. But after the crisis, when they shouldn't be as constrained anymore, it's still something like 14 basis points. So double up, that's what we see before the crisis. And these are the maturity exclusions. So these are extremely safe bonds. Or at least they are investment grade bonds with a very low maturity. If you take this as an illustration, then the red bars here are all the before returns and the blue bars are the after returns. So clearly there's a difference in the cost of immediacy from before to after the crisis. We do the same thing for the uh, downgrades, and this is what we get. The blue lines are again after the crisis, the red lines are before the crisis. And these are not just some very small returns, this is something like 200 basis points, 600 basis points over five days. This is, this is a huge returns, and as a side effect you can see that this is, uh, in some sense, the cost of passive investing in, uh, in corporate bonds, on bonds in general. Very huge cost uh, if you want to track an index. So they make a lot of money when they take these risky bonds on inventory. Uh, it could be uh, fair compensation. <clears throat> what we do up here is then we uh, estimate, or we set up this equation to, with a uh, supply and demand. So there is a demand for immediacy from index traders, and there's a supply of immediacy from the other side of the market, from the dealers. We're going to say that this uh, demand for immediacy is completely inelastic to whatever price they get these index traders. If they can just sell on the right date, well, then they will have minimized their tracking error, irregardless of whatever the price is. So they shouldn't uh, care at all about the price in some sense, and that's also why we see these very huge returns. So what we do here is then we take this uh, <coughs> return and regress it on the, uh, on the supply of immediacy. And this is what we get. So there are some other controls over here, something like how constrained are the dealers, mix index, dealer leverage growth, TED spread. And then we have this up here, which is how much uh, immediacy did these dealers supply. So before the crisis, whenever they supplied immediacy, they didn't increase their returns. 
during the crisis and after the crisis, if you want to get more immediacy, if you want to transact more with these dealers, use their inventory, you have to pay for it. So now it costs you a lot to use the dealer's inventory. Uh, another prediction from this Daryl Duffy paper is, one prediction was about this uh, higher cost of immediacy. Another prediction is that, well, some banks are going to be uh, 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 hurt by this uh, Volcker rule, and they're going to lose market share, essentially. So there's going to be a new participant coming in. Maybe these are not uh, subject to the Volcker rule and stuff like that. So the old star guys should then lose their uh, market share. And this up here is the market share for the top four most active dealers before the crisis. For the maturity exclusions, they had uh, one fifth of the market and 32% down here. But after the crisis, they lose like 10% of the market. And this is despite, so this is uh, the four most active dealers who were alive in the entire period. So again, not something like Lehman. So in here, Lehman is a big player. They go bankrupt. But still, these uh, old players, they don't fill out the void. It's new players coming in over here. So you see all these new banks moving in or at least new market makers moving in. So to sum up, we see that the cost of immediacy is now higher. And this is consistent with all of these predictions from uh, the Dell Duffy paper about side effects of regulation. Uh, we did see that uh, the dealer behavior changed so that dealer takes on less risk now. So in that sense, regulation is a success up here. But on the other hand, remember that the goal of this regulation is that market makers should be able to also make the market at low cost for investors during financial turmoil. And what you need as an investor during a crisis is you need to get immediacy. And the cost of immediacy is now very high. So it's not clear that uh, regulation is a success up here. And this uh, higher cost of immediacy could have a destabilizing effect during a future crisis. Yeah, thank you. on the, uh, the spillover's interactions and unintended consequences of uh, monetary and regulatory policies. Um, and thanks a lot, of course, to the organizers uh, for giving me the opportunity to present this paper. And this is joint work with uh, Kristen Forbes and Tomasz Wiladek. And of course, before moving on, I should say that any views are expressed as solely those of the authors and should not be taken to represent those of the Bank of England or the, on the Monetary Policy Committee. So. One motivation for this paper is the pattern of deglobalization that we can see in recent bank lending data. So this, this chart here displays uh, this pattern. So it shows the exchange rate adjusted stock of bank lending of UK resident banks to the rest of the world. And this pattern is actually very similar to all BIS reporting uh, banking systems, so I haven't repeated it here. Um, and a number of different explanations have been raised in the literature to explain what we call here the first phase of banking deglobalization, uh, which, is, which is highlighted in red, in, in red here. So like market forces, of course, or crisis-related measures, and I will get, get into those explanations. But what is less well known is that even more recent data shows uh, a second phase of banking deglobalization that started at roughly in July, 2000, Ju uh, July 2012. And this has, to our knowledge, been less, uh, less explored in the literature. And of course, there could be a number of different explanations. Again, uh, like the euro era crisis, most obviously, uh, but we try to show in this paper this could also be driven by monetary and regulatory uh, policies taken over this, over this period. So just taking a quick step back, so what could be the possible drivers of banking deglobalization? So I've mentioned already, like, uh, first, uh, weaknesses in demand and econo economic uncertainty. Uh, Ceruti and Klassens in their paper, they also highlight the role in other papers, of course, b banks' vulnerabilities, um, which led to deleveraging also on the supply side, um, and, and also intergroup frictions. And then, of course, before the crisis, wholesale funding formed a big part of banking systems' funding mix, and this has largely dried up with the crisis, so, so forcing banks to cut lending. Then Janetti and Levin in a paper like document the flight home effect, which is probably uh, related to higher costs of banks to go abroad because information asymmetries likely play a larger role uh, in, in, in crisis times as opposed to normal times, like for example, the cost of monitoring uh, uh, abroad. Uh, Rose and Wieladek in a more recent paper by Angena Popov and Van Horen show that 
uh, or they attribute some of the decline in bank lending also to political pressures due to banking nationalization. Um, capital controls could play a role, um, which have been introduced after the crisis a bit more than, than before. Um, but also, um, and this is what this paper is about, regulatory changes and microprudential measures. And this is a bit more discussed on the, on the next slide, um, where, so as you know, like there has been a host of post-crisis regulatory initiatives to strengthen banks' shock absorption capacity, um, and so we have stress testing, capital and liquidity regulations, recovery and resolution regimes, and the more systematic development of macroprudential policies. And of course, that coincided with the introduction of unconventional monetary policy in most advanced economies, the quantitative easing, credit easing policies, forward guidance, and so on. So on the interaction uh, between these policies, there is already quite a bit of work uh, on how regulatory policies can influence the effectiveness of monetary policies. Like the bank lending channel, for example, depends on the, on the size of banks or the bank balance sheet's composition or global banking linkages. And regulation will certainly affect each, each one of these, of these factors. But in this paper, we turn things around and ask, how uh, does, do monetary policies uh, influence the effectiveness of regulatory policies? So though maybe effectiveness is not the right word, because specifically we look at how does the external lending impact of regulatory policies depend on the presence of unconventional monetary policies. And in order to do so, um, we focus on, the, um, on this second phase of banking deglobalization, which has coincided with the introduction of unconventional monetary policies in the UK. So QE was introduced first like in 2009, shortly uh, just after with the, with the crisis, but it has been expanded at the end of 2011 and again in, in, um, in around um, early 2012, just before the funding for lending scheme, the FLS was introduced in the UK in July 2012. And I will say more about what the FLS is, but essentially it's a policy that was used to incentivize lending to UK households and, and, and PNFCs. Um, and at the same time though, there had been an increase in regulation. Um, I guess this is here for the UK, but this has been true in, in, all, in all countries with the Basel packages. So an increase in, in capital requirements. So this chart here uh, shows the evolution of total capital requirements and percent of risk-weighted assets in the UK, um, scaled, uh, now weighted by the, by the size of, of UK banks. And, and you see this, there's a clear upward trend. And so just also to point out, these are general pillar one capital requirements at, at 8%, but also like uh, in addition to this pillar two uh, requirements. And these pillar two requirements differ by bank. And this variation of uh, capital requirements by bank and they change at different points in time, this is what we use in the paper to identify our effects. So just to give a quick overview, uh, in this paper we ask whether the interaction of capital requirements and unconventional monetary policies can explain the second phase of banking deglobalization. And, and to do so, we use a detailed bank data set from the UK to test if capital requirements affected external bank lending negatively, and whether then the FLS or QE amplified these effects by making this type of lending less, less attractive. And the key results are that indeed, the FLS has, has amplified the negative effects of tighter capital requirements on external lending. Um, and we show that this actually really matters for, for the global pattern of, of banking deglobalization. Um, there's limited evidence for, uh, for any type of amplification effects from the presence of quantitative easing policies. Um, maybe just to point out at this stage, of course, none of these policies uh, include external lending in, in their mandate, so that's why we titled the paper as the unintended consequences of, um, of, of, of these policies. Um, before um, getting into further details, or like um, this is a slide um, giving a further overview in the literature, but, but which I actually have to have to skip um, because of the time constraint. Maybe just highlighting one one recent paper. Uh, a bit closer to my heart is like from Claudia Buching, uh, Linda Goldberg, who are, who are heading the international, so-called International Banking Research Network. Um, it's like a network of like around 30 central banks and research teams there, and they summarize in this paper the transmission of a whole range of prudential policies uh, uh, cross-border uh, to other countries. Um, so it's quite interesting. Um, so a bit more on the... Um, Funding for Lending Scheme. So this scheme was introduced in, in July 2012 um, with the idea to stimulate bank lending to households and PNFCs in the UK. Um, it had two uh, major aspects which we kind of rely 
which we base our argument on. And this is uh, for banks that access the FLS. It included a funding subsidy that rose with the amount of FLS eligible lending. Uh, and secondly, it included a for, for all banks, uh, they could profit from a capital offset um, for, for all FLS eligible lending. Um, so they could offset this amount of lending against their capital planning buffers, which would make then this type of lending effectively capital neutral in a risk rate sense. Um, the FLS was designed in two phases. After 2013 Q4, it focused on quite a broad set of lending, household and PNFC lending, and then in 2014 Q1, it was tweaked um, to only focus on PNFC lending. So, um, yeah, there of course has been some work on what does the domestic effect of the FLS. Um, so, a paper by German others at the bank, they document a big drop in banking system wide bank uh, funding costs and a sizable impact on, on GDP growth uh, positively, which also important for us translated this drop in bank funding costs, translated also into lower mortgage and PNFC loan rates. Um, okay, I've spoken already about the evolution of quantitative easing in the UK. Um, so maybe just uh, give it, to give you an idea on what are the theoretical channels we think that are at play. Um, so this slide just tries to discuss what is the effect of an uh, increased uh, capital requirement or risk rated asset um, ratio or requirement. Um, and um, I guess it's fair to say when capital requirements are binding and the Modigliani Miller theorem fails, banks will have to. Uh, to some extent, cut risk weighted assets to meet the increased requirements. Uh, and of course, um, when they decide on what assets they should cut, that will depend, as I maximize return on equity, that will depend on um, the, the relative risk weights and the relative returns of these assets. So just to start, there will be another slide. Uh, we should assume like banks cut across the board in all asset classes. Um, but of course, um, if now a policy changes the relative risk weights for a certain asset class, then keeping everything else equal, then the transmission of um, capital requirement to lending, lending will be different. And this, this is what you can see in this, on this chart, um, where we think that there are several channels uh, that, that reduce the relative risk weights of UK household and PNFC lending. The first may be similar for UQ, QE and the FLS, because lower loan rates will feed um, within the bank's internal risk-based models will feed into a lower probability of default of borrowers and hence like lower risk weights. And then I've discussed already for the FLS specifically, like the two channels, like the capital offset channel and the funding subsidy channel, which, which all speak for uh, um, that uh, UK household and PNFC lending is now more attractive and will be less uh, likely to be subjected to cut once capital requirements go up. Um, so the data we use in this study is the is, um, Bank of England's data set, uh, microbanking data set on external lending by banks. So for each of the banks, we know exactly to which countries do they, do they, do they lend to. And the average UK bank lends to around uh, 50, 53 countries. And uh, we try to make use of that variation. Um, OK, five minute warning. So I will be quick on the, on the regression model. Um, so it's, it's, it's a regression of the growth rate of lending by bank I to country J at time T on the various regulatory factors I've mentioned, so capital requirements, but then also their interaction with, uh, with unconventional monetary policy. So QE and importantly the FLS, which is at first only a dummy variable, which takes a value of zero until 2012 and, and one of course after the introduction of the FLS. But then uh, the argument also realized that like, different banks uh, will be differently impacted by the, by the presence of the FLS. So we make the point that um, banks, which at the outset of the FLS uh, have a very high share, of, uh, or a high share of FLS eligible lending, are more likely to be able in a position to profit and change their lending behavior um, uh, once the FLS has been in place. So if we multiply the FLS with, with, the, with a fraction of FLS eligible lending. And if you would see an amplification effect of the negative effect of capital requirements, you would expect that the coefficient sigma in front of the, the blue terms uh, would be negative and significant. Um, like a, a word on the results, um, which I've mentioned already, like in the first, it's just without the policy interactions, it's just the impact of regulation on external lending, confirming older literature. Um, there's like a negative effect, and to give an idea on the size of the coefficients, um, um, one percentage points increase in capital requirements will reduce external lending growth by 3.3 percentage points over a one-year period. 
And then on the, on the other columns show our main results that, that indeed the FLS had like an amplifying effect on, the, on this negative external effect of, uh, of capital requirements. Um, whereas the QE interactions here in column two, um, they, this one? Yeah. They, they don't turn out to be significant. Um, and like another uh, piece of the analysis we do is to look into um, receiving country characteristics. So does the, the policies or characteristics of countries receiving lending from UK banks, do they matter for this, for these, for the spillovers of capital requirements? Um, so yeah, we, we include an, a, another range of interaction terms uh, between capital requirements and various factors. And we find that after increasing capital requirements, UK uh, banks cut lending more to countries with higher country risk in the first column, or more capital controls here in, in column um, four, uh, or weaker institutions, as, as you can see in, in column two. But they cut less actually to countries with stronger capital requirement regulation, which is consistent with a quite recent paper by FDF Gambagota, Goldberg, and Chaffee, um, or Chiaffi, um, where they um, see that tighter capital requirements have served to shield the country from the negative of effect of external shocks. So here it's of course like just a UK specific shock, not like a global shock as they use as the VIX, but still it, it goes in this direction. And um, final set of slides. So, so then the question we ask like, does that matter? So can we explain banking deglobalization? So in this exercise, we use the estimates of our model to remove the contribution of capital requirement tightening and the FLS interaction from the data and we aggregate up across banks. Um, so in practice, that means that the blue line is like the actual data, um, and the uh, and the green line we remove the impact of increased capital requirements, and then in the red line we, in addition, remove the effect of the interaction uh, factors, the capital requirements, and the FLS. So, well, yeah, I mean, of course, this exercise is not immune to the to the Lucas uh, Lucas critique in any sense, but I think it gives an idea on on how important the results are. So we, we see that in, in the M sets of the FLS and capital requirement uh, interactions, uh, external bank lending would have actually been higher at the outset of the FLS um, and would have been uh, significantly uh, larger at the end of the first phase of, of, the, of the FLS at the end of 2013. So uh, like with some assumptions, we can say like that we can explain around 30% of the decline in bank to bank lending of the UK. Um, maybe an important slide here to make in the, U in the US. This is also very important globally because the, the UK is the largest holder of cross-border banking assets. So taking with some more heroic assumptions in, in this part of the paper, we're taking the, we can explain a third of the UK would mean we can explain like already 10% uh, of the global decline in, in bank to bank, uh, in, ba in, in banking flows during the second phase of banking deglobalization. Um, so I think, sorry, yeah, I'm running maybe a bit. Um, so I can't discuss these extensions. So just to assure you, we try to make sure in the paper that our results are driven by exogenous component of changes in capital requirements and other, other regulatory changes over this period, uh, including on liquidity, as we've seen the, in the in paper before. Um, so yeah, to wrap up, um, so um, we see in the paper um, yeah, that provided some evidence that the interaction of unconventional monetary policies and capital requirements can explain uh, some part of this um, banking deglobalization we see in the data. Um, of course, it's not a welfare analysis, so um, other papers have shown that there's like positive effects on growth in the UK. This will have second round effects in other countries. So we don't say like something on, on the welfare effects of these policies. Um, we've seen the characteristics of receiving countries have mattered for, uh, for spillovers. Uh, and I think more generally, it shows that we need to understand better the interactions of monetary and regulatory policies. Thank you. Thank you. How, how, how do I get to my slides? Maybe just go to the next slide. Oh, okay. Thank you. Okay, thank you.
So I want to begin by thanking, thank, thanking, thanking the organizers uh, for the opportunity. Uh, you know, it, cer it certainly was challenging uh, for me to discuss three papers, um, um, but I learned, I, learned, I learned a lot in the, in the, in the, in the, in, I learned a lot in the process. Uh, so let me, let me, let me begin with sort of some broad, uh, some, with some broad observations about causality, and this shows up in, uh, the issues of causality certainly show up in some of the, the papers, and the, the, fir the, fir the first paper, uh, I think, makes, a ver you know, makes, in fact, a very nice frontal uh, uh, um, a a a attack uh, on causality, I, I think quite nicely, although I have some suggestions for, for an alternative way to proceed, although the authors can't do it directly, but, but by which maybe potentially policymakers uh, could, could, be, could be helpful here. Um, so first, let me note that the causal effects um, um, of liquidity and liquidity regulation are obviously a central issue in the aftermath of, our, of the crisis. And the, 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 the papers before us in part look at this in the context of monetary policy and global lending. Um, causality is important because it's important to distinguish between alternative hypothesis, uh, hypotheses to do identification. It can be that, uh, that's often challenging. And instrument, of course, instruments are difficult to obtain. So one, 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 one approach which I've often favored in a variety of regulatory contexts are what are called natural experiments. Um, and I've been a strong advocate for natural experiments, random assignment, and eligibility. For example, during my, my services as, as chief economist at the SEC, um, we, we moved forward with a, uh, with a randomized experiment on short, on short sale uh, implementation and removed the uptick restrictions on, 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 on short sales. And the SEC is currently um, contemplating using such approaches with respect to make make take pricing and the ways in which liquidity work in our in our in our equity markets, and I think there's no reason that this can't be used um, for broader issues of liquidity as well. Indeed, several years ago at another conference uh, on on liquidity, I was a discussant of a paper on the commercial paper funding facility, which emerged at the heart of the financial crisis, um, and I argued at the time. Um, the authors did a perfectly nice job with identification given the nature of the context, but it was probably actually a more challenging context than, than, the, than the one that we saw before us today um, because there the eligibility was basically linked to past participation. So the identification was kind of largely centered upon a relatively narrow parametric form, and, the, and the, while the authors sort of exploited that to nice advantage, it was sort of too bad, I thought, that the Fed hadn't made um, uh, hadn't used some random assignment at least, and it didn't have to be perfectly random, but it could have been 70% in one bucket, 30% in another bucket, uh, or whatever mechanism they would have liked, um, beca because what I, what I argued at the time, and, and I still strongly believe, um, that it's ultimately important uh, that, we under that we learn from this, so, because if we're, gonna, if we're gonna know how to behave in future crises, the only way we can do so is to learn from the past, and it's important, I think, and I think the, the theme of our conference, obviously, is very important, what can we learn from the past? But I also think it's incumbent upon policymakers to want to learn um, from the past. Um, you know, and so that raised the question, you know, and, and so while there are limitations to such approaches, and the, for example, externalities sometimes arise within the context of, of pilots and the like, um, they're still considered the gold standard in research design. Um, and indeed, this issue came up in the, in the first presentation. The, 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 the question came up, um, the point was made by the author that, he, that they couldn't do a full investigation by, 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 rand, by, ra by random design. For example, it would have been nice, he pointed out, if there was uh, some randomization with respect to some of the pricing um, sort of issues. And I thought that was a very nice point, and it kind of ties in um, directly to my, to my discussion. And this is, so this is up to the regulators, it's up to the Fed, it's up to the Bank of England, it's up to the SEC, uh, rather than researchers. And this is crucial, I want to emphasize, for maximal long-run policy benefit. And I want to emphasize that point. I think it's an extremely important point. Um, um, and to just pursue this to a little bit more, it's important to learn the theme for the, of the conference is terrific along those lines, and the conference is obviously doing its part, but I think it's important for policymakers to do their part. There's simply not been enough attention to learning from the financial crises. Crises are so important, but, they're, but the samples are limited. So we've got to use all the information we can from those limited samples. And I'm not sure that learning has always been a high enough pr regulatory priority, and I'll point to the, the commercial paper funding facility as an example where eligibility was basically link linked to past participation. And I sort of thought that that was, that was a really missed opportunity. And indeed, I'll point to a second kind of more mundane example, the resistance of the Fed 
in the Bloomberg Maiden Lane lawsuit many years after the fact, I think is also illustrative of a, maybe of a, of a reluctance to focus on what, uh, just sort of stepping back and what we can learn. What we can learn is a broader um, uh, s s society. So enough of a, um, um, so, you know, and to pursue this theme in the context of the first paper just slightly more, so that what would be the, the potential for a for natural experiment? Well, I think, you know, in the context of the liquidity coverage ratio and the term deposit facility, um, it seems to me there, there would have been more potential for randomization. Randomization of eligibility, randomization, and as the authors point out, randomization of pricing. Um, and given that the authors basically work um, at a regulator, uh, they, have an, they have an advantage that I no longer have. Um, 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 th they, they can potentially influence the regulatory decision makers. And you know, we often talk, and some of, some of my academic peers point out that practice is ahead of theory. Well, this is the way practice should be ahead of theory, but I think it's not. I think, I think academics are far ahead of practitioners in this space, and I just want to put this issue squarely on the table. The paper does, let me be clear, the paper does a very nice job given, um, uh, given the elements that are available with the design and the potential endogeneity, the diff and diff, the threshold, early withdrawal, foreign versus domestic banks. So this is not a criticism of the paper. It's not a criticism at all, but it is a strong message to the regulatory uh, community, or at least as strong as I can, as strong as I can make it. Now, in terms of, of sort of tying the papers together a little bit more, um, I want to point out that there are varying contexts um, um, and the very context of liquidity. And it's interesting to reflect both in these papers and also this other paper that I discussed a few years ago on the commercial paper funding facility at how the contexts vary. The context involves to some extent monetary policy. They involve trading, costs of trading bonds and portfolio liquidity. They involve feedback effects. We study these issues in a variety of contexts. We study liquidity sometimes in the crisis. We study it, now we're studying it, in fact, with respect to the normalization of policy and how we exit, which has obviously become obviously an important issue of the day and um, um, one, one, one of our, uh, obviously, a kind of a current uh, key challenge. Um, um, a key issue with respect to liquidity and risk taking, I think really merges nicely from these papers, and so I wanna also commend the organizers for selecting these papers and packaging them together for the following reason. That, you know, it never really sort of, I never focused before on the c connection between ex ante and ex post. Liquidity, when we talk about liquidity, it's really about the ex post. Things like Volcker are ex ante. A lot of the focus is on ex ante. Um, um, I always have to tell you, I thought that when practitioners were complaining about lack of liquidity in the markets, I thought it was just sort of some self-interested point but now I'm, I'm appreciating better that this is about ex ante versus ex post. Um, um, you know, the paper made, a, uh, the paper made a ni the nice point that, you know, we want to see what the, f you know, if, if, fire, if fire sale pricing is really bad, that's going to exacerbate a crisis. So it's, so on the one hand, we want to have the right ex ante incentives. Um, maybe Volcker helps encourage that, although I don't have a particular point of view about Volcker either, 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 either way. Um, but there's trade-offs between ex ante uh, and 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 ex and and ex and ex and ex and ex, and ex post. Um, do, uh, do potentially, we want to enhance liquidity in the crisis, uh, and that's um, that's important. Um, um, what Volcker does is it potentially reduces liquidity to control to contr to help to help control risk taking. Um, all right. So that's both some general comments, some framing comments, comments about the first paper. So let me turn to the second paper. Um, uh, and this is an issue I've thought about over the years because as an investor, and an investor who somet uh, uh, sometimes who invests in index funds, but not, not always, um, thought about these issues from an investor's uh, perspective a bit, and, and also thought about it from a market microstructure type of perspective as well. So we measure trading, so it's a very nice approach, I thought. Uh, sort of, you know, it's one of these approaches you kind of wish, but why didn't I think of that? Um, well, and I just didn't. Um, here they measure trading costs by, by looking at the index exclusion events. A very nice uh, approach. Now, whether it kind of fully gets to the issues, you know, I think we can have some debate about, and I'm not quite sure which way I come down in the end. I did think that the bus versus plane analogy was sort of cure interesting, but maybe a little bit overdone. Um, I thought that was a little bit unfair to the regulators. Um, um, but, I wanna, but I wanna really, should we focus on extreme liquidity, is, uh, on extreme impatience is the way I frame it up in the question. In, in, in my slide, but the context of very, di the equity, I want, I want to point out, and, and the thing that I sort of struggled with when I read the paper, is that the equity in the bond context seemed to me very different. Replicating especially the S&P 500 
fund. This is kind of, this is pretty easy, piece of cake. Uh, uh, everybody and his brother knows how to do it, dot, dot, dot. Um, the bond indices, they're more challenging to replicate. Um, they're more challenging because a lot of these instruments are illiquid for exactly, you know, for exactly the kind of indirectly the issue on the table. So what do the funds do? They don't even try to replicate it. So the funds themselves aren't trying to replicate it, and yet then the challenge that's, so there's almost an intellectual inconsistency. We're using as a measurement the benchmarking against, uh, based on exact replication, but the funds don't even do it themselves. Um, the paper taught, ta one of the things the paper taught me was that 20% of the bond, bond investments are outside the index. Um, so the indexes aren't doing the replication themselves, and yet we're blaming the regulators, and we're, but we're, we're providing, we're using as a standard for the regulators these index exclusions, but this isn't even what the funds do. And so I think this is an issue, they, they, you know, I think it's an issue worth thinking about. The tracking errors are very different. 2.7 basis points for the, for the BGI S&P 500, and 20, yeah, 23 and a half, 23 and a half basis points um, for the Vanguard total uh, bond market index. These are, very, these, are, these, are, these are clearly very, very different. I, tell, I teach my MBA students, um, there are good indices and bad indices. And there's some indices you'd probably be happy to be in, and some, you should watch your back. And one of the ones I point out, I, I never thought about bond funds in that context, but I tell them the Russell 2000, you ought to watch your back because of the well-known massive problems associated with the Russell reconstitution um, effect. And you're leaving huge, and it's sort of well-known, and it's my studies, um, that you leave huge amounts of money on the table with that. So should we measure, should we measure impatience in the same way for bond and index bond and equity index funds? I'm sort of doubtful. Um, the paper says the lack of transparency makes it even more important for the funds to keep a low tracking error, referring to the bond funds. I don't get it. I just didn't get, I just didn't understand that. Greater deviation suggests to me that there's more scope to manage costs rather than tight tracking errors from a moral hazard and agency perspective. So it seems to me um, the, 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 the fact that there, it's hard to do gives more flexibility and, and kind of, I think this really cuts to the issue at hand. Uh, you know, and this is, um, uh, this is analogous to issues that arise with ETFs uh, as, as well. So while I, uh, while I agree also that reduced liquidity typically suggests that there's less liquidity and greater cost of impatience, I also want to suggest an alternative. It could be that there was technological change which allowed there to be less liquidity uh, and higher turnover, and then there would be greater, greater liquidity, and I don't, that issue was never really taken on. Now, of course, I don't, I don't, that's not what I think is really happening in the sample, so I'm not, I don't want to say that, but there is a this is a conceptual point. It's sort of like supply versus demand. Um, now, I do think a better fit for the story in the paper is that the Volcker rule has caused substitution away from using dealer inventory and taught free-range trades with customer liquidity. But okay, so that's what's happened. Is that, is that so bad? Um, um, it's just a different, it's a different way of sort of organizing things. Um, so that's my, my comments on the second paper. So third paper. Um, so I learned a lot from this paper too. Um, and I don't really know much, I really don't know so much about the international finance and the, and the, and the institutions, but it, it just got me thinking as well. Measures, my takeaway broadly is that measures to raise domestic lending uh, certainly are not free of economic performance. Now that I kind of thought I understood, but one of the key reasons is the international effects. There are strong substitution effects, or what in other contexts we would call crowding out, that reduce uh, cross-border lending, and these are very significant. Now I had been aware of this in other contexts. I certainly was aware um, that some of the policy actions of our Federal Reserve and of other central banks have, have consequences for other countries and that the central banks typically kind of deny that. In fact, the U.S. Treasury, they kind of have this, there was this boilerplate I haven't heard so much about in recent years, but for several decades, there were a bunch of secretaries of the Treasury who, um, um, who, who would say, we're the spokesperson for the dollar. And the, the Fed, they do their thing. Um, and I never really quite understood that because I guess I always thought that these things were kind of a little bit intertwined. Um, but in any case, other countries are clearly, da can be damaged um, by decisions that are made uh, with a domestic orientation. And this is called a, a little typo here. I said, beggar thy, th they neighbor. It should be beggar thy neighbor. This is called beggar thy neighbor in the context of a monetary policy and maybe in, in, a, in an array of other contexts. Another kind of example that also kind of points to the substitution effects, there's this term of art that's come up in recent years called crony capitalism. One of the problems of crony capitalism where certain projects or investments are favored is that 
it comes at the expense of others. It comes at, it basically leads to a distortion. It leads to a misallocation. And that's kind of implicitly, I think, sort of part of the message of the paper, but in terms of the global arena. Now, how would I interpret, well, let me, uh, 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 almost done, but. So how would I interpret these results? Um, so to the extent, uh, particularly with respect to higher capital. So to the extent that global lending is reduced, it's natural, I think, that higher capital stand, to the extent that they're being reduced in the presence of the higher capital standards, I think it's natural to think that what higher capital standards are doing is that they're reducing the, prob the possibility of bailout. They're and so they're reducing risk-taking incentive. That seems to me to be the core. And that's, I think, how the authors should sort of think about their empirical results. I would think about their empirical results through that lens. And my sense is you can probably explain most of your empirical results with respect to the interaction with capital through that lens. I, I think it's an explanation, for example, for the receiving country results. I think it's an explanation for why bank, if you assume that bank-to-bank -bank lending is especially risky, I think that's why there's a larger contraction there. I think the banks are responding to the, the fact that they don't have, they're not looking so much for, a, they, they, can't, they, they don't look as much for a bailout if they have more of their capital on the line. And so I think that's a potentially good, good lens to, to interpret the results through. I should also point out that in terms of bigger future directions, the focus here obviously was from one country's perspective, from England's perspective, but they do have cross-country results. Um, but I think the cross-country, they have some cross-country results, but I think thinking about cross-country more, more broadly is worth studying. The paper notes different country, the paper notes that different countries are altering their policy regime at the same time. That suggests an interesting, almost gaming kind of issue. There's interactions across countries. These are potentially very important and affect regulatory spillovers, negative externalities and the like all come to mind. And I think thinking about the nature of equilibrium and what the implications are empirically, this could be, a, this I think would be an, at least an intellectually fascinating issue. And, I, and so often those issues um, in these kind of contexts do, do give one empirical traction. So finally, I'm going to conclude. Um, and I want to focus on, I want to word in the title. So this is a little bit kind of off point, so maybe a little bit, but, it, but because it plays a central role in the title of the paper, I do want to put this issue on the table because this term, this is a term of art that I learned, I learned when I went to Washington this, as, as, at the SEC more than a decade ago. Uh, that was the term unintended consequences. I must say, I got very upset about the use of this term. And the reason I got, and I think, but I think there's some lessons in this. Um, why did I get upset? Because uh, what I, heard, I heard this term almost immediately when I arrived at the SEC. Now, why did I get upset? Well, because this term was being used repeatedly by SEC lawyers to try to walk away from the full set of consequences of the various rules that they created. Um, um, and so I thought this was, this was sort of ridiculous. Uh, the, uh, um, um, you know, it seemed to me there were kind of a number of questions you could ask. Are these rules outside the motivation of the regulation? Yeah, they were. I mean, and, and any time the rule was, any time the consequences were outside the motive, the lawyers felt that they could use the term unintended consequences. Now, of course, that's not how the authors are using the term. I, I, I want to acknowledge that. But are these outside the motives of the regulation? Yeah. So they, usually they were outside the motives of the regulation, right, but that's the point. Uh, some, were they secondary consequences? Well, maybe they were. Maybe they weren't. Sometimes they were the most important consequences, but sometimes they were secondary. Well, the unimportant consequences, never. Um, that's the point, that's why they were on the table. They were important. Can they be unexpected? No, why? Because usually, these unintended consequences were discussed in the regulatory proposal. So even the lawyers understood these consequences. So if the lawyers understood these consequences, they couldn't possibly, of course, be unexpected because obviously they were in everybody's information set. Anyway, let me stop at this point. But this, I thought this was a fascinating, this is a fascinating set of papers with a lot of interesting uh, interconnections be between them. All right, so we'll open up for questions. Um, uh, I was told I get the prerogative of the first one. Um, and, and this is for uh, Jens and, and Marco with respect to your paper. Um, I, I agree the method is, is exceedingly clever. Um, I, I, I live on the side of the people who do this for a living day in and day out uh, and, and watch what, what they do and how they do it. Um, so liquidity, like uh, the stock market, uh, it fluctuates, um, and a smart investor has to optimize given the fact that the liquidity fluctuates. If you think about the um, mathematical optimization, you'll, 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 you'll maximize your alpha subject to a risk constraint and some notion of the transactions costs you incur. Uh, 
So given that, um, what, what, what do you take away as the, um, the, the, the policy implications, uh, things we learned from your results? Yeah, so uh, thank you for the question. So I think that the policy implication is uh, first and foremost that the industry and the regulators should be on the same page and uh, acknowledge that something has changed with liquidity. So that this uh, Yosco report from uh, last month is still saying that we cannot see any changes and at least there, the, I mean, they should acknowledge there is a change. And once we're on the same page, then we can start to discuss solutions and is this uh, driven by causality? Like, is it regulation, all of it, or is it just they change their risk aversion? At least it's uh, consistent with being an impact of regulation. So should you then uh, undo the regulation? That's probably highly unlikely to happen. So again, what should then the, uh, the, uh, the policy change be? And maybe they should look for more uh, uh, exchange traded trading, limit order book and stuff like that. That's at least what the industry uh, themselves uh, suggest. But I guess the policy implication is uh, first and foremost that we should agree that something has changed at least. And I think that uh, uh, extreme impatience is important to look at. I mean, you can say in normal times, sure, we can wait around for a transaction and find a counterparty. But during a crisis, I mean, index trackers may not be the most important people in the world, but we do a need to have immediacy and be able to sell out quickly. That's also a kind of like a, the intention with the liquidity coverage ratio that you should have this buffer of highly liquid assets so that you can sell them exactly when you need the money. And that's why we need immediacy in some sense. Well, but you said high, so interesting, one thing you said, high, highly liquid assets. So arguably the S&P 500 is a, little, is a little different than a bond index fund where 20% of the investments aren't even in the index. Um, but but you but I think still what you you know that, that, that's not to take away from anything that you said. Yeah. But yeah. that's that's where part of the challenge is. Uh, yeah, I, I agree. <laughs> because one implication might be that haircuts on corporate bonds should be adjusted, and their use as collateral should be uh, made consistent with what can actually be achieved in the marketplace. Yeah. Um, can I? I'd like to follow up on that. So I think in terms of policy implications for market liquidity. Just to, to raise two issues. One, um, before the crisis, as you showed, transaction costs were quite low. But it didn't really help at all once the crisis hit. So it's not clear that low transactions costs are a good measure of liquidity, because what you care about is whether you have liquidity in stress periods, not in normal times. So how you just sort of how you characterize what we, what, when market liquidity is important. But that's I think also the extreme impatience in some sense. Yeah, exactly. Um, and then in terms of the empirics, you use um, your crisis up through August 2009 um, and then post-crisis. That's in some sense pre-regulation. So I don't know how you distinguish between how firms mm. change their own risk management practices and decide what to do on their own versus regulations, and so if there's a way for you to distinguish that, that would be very helpful. Yeah, so thanks for the question. So I agree that uh, these are important uh, subjects. To take the last uh, one first, then you're saying, so in some sense I'm claiming this is an effect of the Volcker Rule. Mm -hmm. And the Volcker Rule doesn't come into effect until after our time period ends. So how can it be the Volcker Rule? Uh, so in the paper we are a little more uh, <laughs> strict on that point, but. So what we are saying is that we are at least consistent with the predictions from Dal Duffy saying that this should be the uh, impact of this regulation once we see it. And what we are saying is that this is uh, an impact of anticipated tighter regulation. So the Volcker rule and all of these capital requirements, I mean, they start to talk about them already in 2008, and then they uh, are afraid of getting stuck with these very high levels of inventory. Before the crisis, they had these uh, $280 billion on inventory, and you don't want to get stuck with that kind of money uh, on your inventory. Uh, later on if they actually ban proprietary trading and raise capital requirements. So that's why you see these very low uh, levels of inventory after the crisis. That's at least what, uh, that's also, I guess, uh, what the industry is telling us. Yeah, but you still have to but distinguish it, you, between what a firm chooses to do on its own versus a binding capital requirement. Yeah, yeah. Um, following up, um, you alluded to ETFs, and um, how important are they? I believe, oh, Ben can correct me, he's the expert on this, but 15% of um, corporate is, I believe, owned by ETFs. Uh, I might guess that 50% of the demand for immediacy is because of ETFs, which started in October 2003 and has grown 
significantly since the second crisis. So how much do ETFs matter, or maybe it's just a closer, and they don't matter? Yeah. yeah, so the numbers I've seen is that ETFs, they own 1% of the market. But by number of transactions, then they account for 15% of the transactions. So they're still, uh, they're very active in the market, but they're still a small part of the market. But they could, I mean, you are right that uh, index tracking in general is uh, going up. But we actually don't see that in the data. We don't see this uh, very steep trend in index tracking. So the number of, uh, the amount of money being uh, sold and bought each month is fairly stable over time. But uh, index tracking for an ETF is slightly different than what we described up here. So, uh, I mean, they have to buy and sell uh, repeatedly also during the month whenever they are uh, investor shares so go up and down essentially if people go out or go into the fund. And that gives them some leeway. They don't have to transact exactly at this date zero. They can do it outside of that date and still have a fairly low tracking error, especially at this point in time when they just uh, increases their assets under management. I mean. They can just buy whatever and keep it on inventory, essentially. So it, for our sample period up here, it's not uh, affecting our uh, analysis, at least. But it's, it is an important question, and also in the future, definitely. Uh, I have also a question for Jen. So uh, apologies for the continuation. It follows up on, on Nelly's question. So uh, there, there are these two distinct time periods you care about. You care about normal times, and you care about crisis times. And you have two values you're trying to map on. You've got an efficiency value and a stability value. So I couldn't tell from your first set of remarks with respect to the efficiency value. It is all the efficiency loss basically made up by HFT intraday trading and doesn't show up or it's in there? And I, I don't get it. Um, and then secondly, on the stability point, people say, well, even if HFT substitutes on the efficiency side, you know, in a crisis, uh, HFTs won't catch the falling knife and the dealers used to. That's sort of the industry argument. Sure, my view is the dealer never caught the falling knife. Um, you know, if anybody did, it might have been like in the 80s life insurance companies. But, but basically nobody catches that anymore except Nelly. So, uh, <laughs> so, so how should I think about it? You know, your, your paper in, that, in light of those different values. Yeah, so what do exactly do you mean by efficiency? Can you elaborate? Oh, so, so I'm just, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll take your measure as an efficiency measure. Okay. Uh, ease of comparison. Yeah. Uh, so I'm not quite sure exactly how to answer your question. I mean, so what we show is that uh, transaction cost has gone up when you do immediacy. So that is, the market is in some sense less efficient today. But those uh, who actually pay the price for this is the passive investors. I mean, it's not the index, uh, I mean, it's not uh, the index funds that just take their fee. And you can still have a, a tracking error of zero, but these would still be an indirect cost of doing passive investment. So those who are hurt, essentially, in this uh, very uh, specific uh, sense, at least, is the uh, passive investor, those who buy into these funds. I mean, there should be some kind of, uh, they should uh, transact, not all at the same time, because then you get this massive selling pressure. They should spread out. That would be more optimal. But it seems like they really do care about this uh, zero tracking error, and by doing that, I mean, they get these very high uh, costs. So they are catching the falling eye for um, what do you want to I mean. So, uh, so it is. Uh, Sorry, I, thought, I think of those as two different things. One is sort of like, what, what's the efficiency cost of running the market in normal times? And then second, is there liquidity to the market when it falls apart? Yeah. But it seems like if no one is willing to actually uh, use their inventory, then it's difficult to see that there should be liquidity once the market falls apart because. I mean, market makers would still do like matching agency trading and stuff like that, but that's not really what you need during a crisis. You really want to have a, some, a little bit faster trading. And maybe a matching buy side to buy side could uh, alleviate that. So we have some kind of a exchange trade stuff instead where you can actually have a buy side and buy side and they meet each other without the dealer. Well, then you're not uh, dependent upon the dealer to take on inventory. But it's not clear that uh, I mean, that the buy side would then step up during a crisis and actually make the market. So, so there's no really easy solutions, uh, definitely not in our paper at least. On the paper about foreign lending, how do, just institutional knowledge, how does RBC fit into all of these, your calculations? I mean, they're, Owned by the government, they were a big foreign lender. 
how does that affect your results? Sorry, did you say RBC? Um, yeah, the Royal Bank of Scotland. In, okay. in, the, in, the, foreign, in the foreign lending, the Bank of England people. Uh, so, uh, foreign banks are, sorry? Oh, no, oh, no, oh, sorry. I thought that you were asking about the Ulster retirement. Um, I, yeah, I'm not sure if I have looked specifically at the data for like, for like this in, individual, individual bank. I think that would be probably broadly reflecting the general trend of, of reduced lending externally. I mean, they have, there has been a general retrenchment of the of the British banking system uh, abroad. Um, I believe they have access to the FLS, um, so there will be like some effect from from, from this side as well. Um, yep. The point we are making in the paper is also like a, about a relative point. So it's not necessarily about whether they are absolutely riskier or less risky than, than domestic loans, because I think I would agree. With, I mean, they would probably be in most cases riskier. Depends, of course, on the on the countries you are lending to and the type of type of lending. But yeah, the point is just kind of the additional effect of the FLS, which have tilted like the relative risk weights where we where we get our results from. Um, yeah. Yeah, I think that's, that's a, a common story, but Chester's story was, I think. Yeah, yeah, my, 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 my story was that with capital, the, the first order, you know, the argument for higher capital is basically an, argu an argument about risk, about risk taking by the financial institutions, that the financial institutions should need to eat the risks. And the way they mm. eat the risks is that basically they're at the margin, i.e., that they have high capital. That's the argument for high capital. So that's basically a bailout, that's basically a risk taking slash bailout story. And so that would seem to me to, I, I thought it fit a number, I thought it fit a number of, of your facts um, because the facts seemed to, you were, sometimes in a way even you wove the narrative, you were suggesting, I thought, that the, that the foreign countries had, had greater risk, that you, you pointed to, that there were, that the, when the foreign, and specifically when particular foreign countries had higher risk, that those would show up as having more of this contraction effect. So that's why I mm -hmm. thought it pointed in, in this direction. Now, now Debbie's suggesting a, a, different, a different hypothesis um, having to do with diver, uh, diversification, and those, those would obviously be contrasting hy hypotheses. But I think, I think there's, a, there's a, a nice opportunity here to sort of try to drill down on the, on the issue of capital and risk taking and, and or <coughs> diversification and some of those trade-offs. And um, I think that's, that's, that's way underexploited, I think, right, right now. And then going beyond that might be to consider then the other, then, then looking at it kind of more symmetrically from the point of view of various countries. But I think even within the context of this study, um, there's, there's, there's a bunch you could potentially just try to tease out. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think it's just put very, uh, very nicely. And I, I agree with that. I think in our paper there are a few interesting facts on this, also like just how regulators set capital requirements. So like an older research by my, one of my courses, Thomas Wieladek and Kalomi, Charles Calumiris as well, they, they have like these pre-crisis papers on Bank of England uh, lending and the impact of capital requirements, uh, sorry, uh, UK banks lending and the effect of capital requirements. And they make the point is driven most, mostly by operational risk considerations, like the fact that the regulators increase uh, capital requirements. Uh, and a lot of policy statements on this that also like support this point. But then I think with the crisis, there's been like a rethinking like about like, the role of country risk. Uh, and regulators certainly have looked much more at this. And like in the paper, we have like some regressions where we show like what, what actually makes regulators change their capital requirements. Uh, yeah. and, and we see like that actually now balance sheet items like feature quite, quite strongly like domestic lending, not so much external lending, but... Um, but but part, of, part of my point was that, that part of the opportunity is to look at how institutions respond so not, not so much what the, what the regulators say the reason is, 
but how do the institutions respond and what does that tell us about bailouts and risk taking and the possibly central importance of that in bank decisions? That seems to me to be the heart of the issue, not, not so much necessarily what the central bank said was the reason they put these things into effect, although that might, that might come into the picture as well. Um, yeah. Actually, I wanted to follow up a little bit more on the, on the LCR and liquidity coverage ratios that, that basically my understanding is that, that, that first of all, um, that these are, are, this is the primary regulation that's causing some of the ripples in, in financial markets where we previously thought were basically arbitrage relationships that banks are now not closing, such as um, covered interest parity and, and some things in the treasury market. That, that banks have instituted, because this is now a binding constraint for some of the major banks, that they've actually instituted internal processes to optimally allocate um, regulatory capital, where before they just thought loosely about regulatory capital and very carefully about their actual capital, uh, or the, their, their view of their economic capital. Um, and, and that that suggests that, in fact, actually across markets, you should be able to see some of these consequences that you're looking at, um, potentially in which banks are getting into which markets. Banks with less tight capital ratios are going to be stepping in and closing, um, closing gaps or shifting their, their resources around quite differently than banks with binding constraints. Uh, and I guess I'd, I'd be curious to see if, if when you're looking across these banks that supposedly have slightly different strengths of binding LCRs, whether you see that in the portfolios more generally and in other things that they're doing. Um, and given the amount of information, I'm not sure. Uh, or you can get from the YNCs and the call reports that, that that might be actually very interesting to investigate some of the broader implications of this particular experiment. Or yep. do you have a sense of any of the broader implications? Um, ideally, we, we would like to measure the LCR for each bank in our data. We couldn't do that. I, I, I mentioned this. You'd like to know lambda, the, the marginal, the shadow price. Sorry? You'd like to know the shadow price. Of the yes. So. At any point in time. Uh, so we have this, this problem, which is the lack of data. Uh, we would like to know which are the banks that are, are close to the binding constraint and which ones are not. So we could not measure that because we, we didn't have the data for, to build the denominator for all the, all the banks, at, uh, for none of the banks at the time. And now we have only for those banks that are subject to the LCR. So we cannot do a comparison between uh, LCR and non-LCR banks. And the banks that are subject to the LCR are, are only a few. I don't know if we'll be able to do any meaningful econometric comparison. But uh, uh, we understand that this is the, the, the crucial point here, uh, to understand what, what the behavior of banks that are close to the, the, uh, to the binding constraint and, and against those that are not. Now, uh, just because to expand, so some activities are going to be cheap on bank capital and expensive on regulatory capital, and some activities the reverse. And so, if you potentially saw the range of activities that a bank was undertaking, and as you saw relative movements in the expensive on one front and the cheap on the other, you could understand to what extent the, which of the constraints is their first order constraint at that point, or how tightly binding one versus the other is. There might be times when a bank is not constrained on the LCR, but is constrained, you know, it faces its usual budget constraints, and other times when, it's, when it is, and then it's, it should, you should see a shift in the composition of that bank's activities. Uh, yeah, I, I fully agree with that. Yeah. Liquidity ratio is another, sorry, the uh, leverage ratio is another, you know, that's one stable funding ratio is another, capital is yet another, and the derivative rules and the TLAC and all that, uh, they kind of happen at the same time, not the same month, but certainly the same years. So how comfortable are we in pinning down this effect to this particular rule? And in general, is that an answerable question, I guess, um, pinning down to exactly rules uh, rather than is the general outcome of uh, regulation? Yes, uh, I fully agree that there are confounding effects that we need to separate from what we're doing. Uh, there are many assumptions in, what, uh, in our estimation. One of the assumptions is that uh, that change in behavior that we observe uh, before and after October of 2014 uh, is, can be attributed to the, to the early withdrawal feature. And we're working with a very narrow uh, time window between um, May 2014 and December 2014. We didn't expand that much, uh, in part because of this concern. Uh, 
But yes, I, we, in the paper we try to, to separate the effects of uh, the LCR and the early withdrawal feature from other uh, constraints. So if we end a few minutes early, that's great, because the lunch, we should start promptly at 12.30. We have a lunch speaker, so why don't we take a 15-minute break now if there's no more comments. And I think lunch is across the hall. Good. Long, long, long.